Praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. This is Elder Joseph Stafford of the Man from Heaven Ministries, bringing you today more Kingdom Principles. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to talk today about communion for the church of today. Communion for the church of today. I hope this finds you in a place where you can receive this word. It's going to be a little longer than I normally do. It's going to go into some in-depth teaching concerning the communion or uh, some call the Last Supper. We're going to talk about that and its ramifications upon us this day and time. So let us pray. We want to make sure our minds and hearts are ready to receive this word. So Father God, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, I ask you God to open the minds and hearts of those under the sound of my voice to receive your word. I pray God that as a sower sowed seed, that this seed goes on good ground. If there's some stony ground, Father, I ask you to break it up, make it palatable so it becomes as flesh to receive your word. We give you all praise for now, Father, knowing that your word is faithful and true, will not come in void, but accomplish that which you sent it to do. So I, I speak that as your servant, speaking your word, that things will come to pass according to your perfect will. And I call it done. In the name of Yeshua, Hamashi, I pray. Amen. Amen. In looking up the word communion, we found a few places in the scripture, not many, but communion by itself basically means in the Hebrew, a word called Sayach. Sayach is spelled S-I-Y-A-C-H, which confers communion, which reflects meditation or thought. We have, um, I looked it up also in the English translation from online dictionary and this is the first statement that it says is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts or feelings especially when it is the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level okay so i pose three points three questions with some subtitles there to get us going in the right direction to see what we're doing when we talk about communion what are we doing what is it all about the first statement I have, what's the reason for communion? I'm going to echo some of the same definition from the English, but also some other things as well um, in this first exchange. It's to start the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental and spiritual level. Remember the sacrifice and the rationales of the meanings for the future starting now. It was also a command from Jesus. Luke 22, 19, King James versions. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in, remember, in remembrance of me. So this is the, this is the purpose for remembrance. Communion means remember, special thought, spirituality concerning him is to remember. Now, when we remember, we don't just Remember, as a fleeting thought, we make it alive. We make it vibrant. We make it a reality that we become aware of what actually took place, what it really cost for our salvation. So in doing that, we look at all the aches and pains that came with the body being broken and the blood being spilled. Let's go a little further. Um, so if that's the case, we're remembering, what about the former teaching of feast days? We're going to go through that real briefly. Um, I can go in depth about those particular feasts and the rationales behind them. But a lot of those feasts pointed toward the Messiah and those have been fulfilled. So to tell people not to do it is not to give them opportunity to see for themselves. Or tell them to do it, we will be then, I say, crucifying Christ afresh. Because we're not saying he ain't come when he has come. We're saying it's not fulfilled when he has fulfilled it. So let me read the statement that I put together. The feast days were for at times to remind people of the power of their God and to point to the promise of the coming king. On the day of Pentecost, we'll fulfill the promise of power and completion of a time due to the passion and the resurrection of, of Jesus. The other feasts had their place 
but all the promise and purpose were fulfilled in Christ. These are the feasts that were observed and in the Jewish community are being observed and kept up now. Passover, week of only unleavened bread, Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, the Days of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, the Great Day, the Last Great Day, the Feast Days ordained at the creation of the world, the Feast Day commanded in their uh, external nature, the Feast Day and the reminder of the sin of Jeroboam, Israel's catastrophic blunder. To say to do away with all is not to remember the deliverance God brought to, brought in the past, but that propels us into the present and future of the fulfillment found in Jesus. So the balance of that statement, the balance of the, the teaching about the feast is to recognize that all was fulfilled in him. There's nothing wrong with recognizing the beginnings, the days that um, of feast days, because they echo the idea of when God made heaven and earth and put time and place to observe the days and feast days going forward. So we can recognize who who God really is in us and what he means, means to us in fullness. So um, the question then comes, but what about burnt offerings? The burnt offerings often follow the feast and often were a source of food for the priests and their families. The purpose as we are in Christ is not needed for the signs of the times and other methods were devised to aid in the priest's survival. Because of Jesus being the final and best sacrifice for the deliverance of all our sins and transgressions, the need for other sacrifices are not warranted. So, Again, right now, since we live in a monetary society to where we um, basically buy and sell with cash to get what we need, the, the idea of the priest needing a sacrifice come, coming to them to give before God that they take the food themselves and feed their families is not found in the dollar bill, the coin, the shekel, the, the um, various denominations, monies around the world to put into their hands so they can go to the market and buy what's needful for their families as well as they're to be the, the leaders of the church as well or their synagogue. Um, so that being said, for us who are Christians, we recognize what has happened. We don't denounce it, but we, act, we accept the idea that the perfect sacrifice has come. That's found in Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. So the question I have is, what does it all mean? What does it all mean? That's point two. St. Luke 22, 19 through 22, in the King James Version says, and I'm just rereading part of what I read earlier and also adding some more to it. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, this is my body, which is broken, which is given for you. This do remembers of me. Likewise, also he took the cup uh, and uh, after supper saying this is the cup this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you but behold the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on this table and truly the son of man goeth as it was determined but woe unto that man of whom it, he is betrayed now that has a, um, a little bit of power pack there because he wants to recognize first of all the body being broken. His body is going to be broken for us. His blood is going to be shed for us. And the, the key is when he said, the blood of the new, the, my blood is shed, is shed for you, is of the New Testament. Okay, let me say that what is, way, the way it said is that, likewise, see, also, also the cup, also, likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus says life is the blood. So let's look at this very closely. Jesus was born of a young maiden. I'm saying that way because the translation is version, but uh, in the English, but the translation to the Hebrew is young maiden. So the young maiden who knew no man 
was impregnated by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, which means that every child has his father's blood. So this blood that he has in him was, was the blood of the Father, of God. So when we look at the blood being shed from Jesus, having the blood of the Father, we have the New Testament or the New Covenant established in his blood or in life, eternal life, never to go away, to be existing forever, in fulfilling everything that God has said that he would do. Now let's go a little further in this. And I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say here is that with the lifeblood of Jesus being the blood of the Father, spilled on the earth, into the earth on our behalf, and into this earth as a new covenant. I speak of myself as this earth, and I speak of you as this earth. That we have the lifeblood of Jesus in us. We have the eternity in us before we accept that sacrifice. And in doing this, we remember keeping it fresh in our mind that we have this lifeblood in us. We have the brokenness of the body in us because as he took away our sins, he took away our uh, uh, um, iniquities, we have followed that as we accept the sacrifice through salvation. We follow that by recognizing when Paul said we must work at our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. We must recognize that as a point of suffering because we have to break away from the yoke of sin and the bondage of transgressions. And by doing that, we do it through fasting, prayer, and study. And as often as we do this, as he says, we remember, we remember the sacrifice. We echo the sacrifice on a daily basis. We do this as we go before him and yield ourselves before him, being humble and meek. Humbleness means we, we lower ourselves. We don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought. In meekness, we means that we are under his control. So in order to be under his control, we must humble ourselves. In order to humble ourselves, we must get rid of the sin. Get rid of the activity that's there. And we do that through, again, three-step process. Fasting, prayer, and study. Fasting, prayer, and study. So we remember this. It's in remembrance of this that we move forward. Now, point A of part two is body broken. We have um, scriptures in 1 Peter 2, 19-25, King James Version. We'll read only a verse of that so we can um, expedite our movement forward. But you can read this in your leisure. Again, 1 Peter 2, 19, 19 through 25. What is the purpose of the body being broken? We find the answers here. Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body? On the tree that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body. On the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. So we know about the stripes. We know that he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. These Cat of nine tails basically mean there were metal spikes at the end of the ropes that went across his back. And as they hit his back, they tore into his flesh and pulled up skin, leaving open, gashing wounds and sores. These are the stripes that are spoken about here, the suffering that he did on our behalf, that we may be healed. The healing is not a mental thing. Is a physical and mental and spiritual thing because the healing does not just stop at one point. It covers every aspect of life. We are healed from our own mind. We're healed from our sins and iniquities that have been put upon us because of the fall of Adam. We're healed from the influence of the attack of the enemy because we now have girded up the armor of God so we can fight against the attack of the enemy to keep our minds in perfect 
condition before him. As it says in Ephesians, cast down imagination and every high thing is all itself against the knowledge of God, bringing the captivity of every thought to the beings of Christ. So in doing that, we have to have that availability knowing that he's there for that purpose and in, and in his stripes, we are healed. We're delivered and set free. Now understand this. We're delivered and set free not to be delivered and set free alone, but to deliver others as well. As we read early, as we as we read on, we'll see some more direction that Jesus gives us as what we're to do moving forward. So let's go into part B of section two of blood spill consumed as wine. The statement, there's a statement about Jesus of life being in the blood. So we find the statement here. We read in John 6, 48 through 58. I'm going to key out verse 53. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So remember this. This symbol is an actual purposeful scenario as to what has happened in your life. So it's not like you eat the blood, also eat, the, eat the bread and also becomes flesh. It's symbolic in their, uh, their avenue, but the reality of the matter is, is that when you eat his flesh, you are partaker, you are identifying, you're saying, I identify with your suffering. I accept your suffering as a propitiation for my sin, a taking away of my iniquity. I accept it as I drink your blood, drink the wine as your blood. I accept the life that you're giving me. I accept the eternal life that's found in your blood that's now in me. So this is a continuation of what Jesus wanted us to be aware of, saying as often as you do this, you show for the Lord's death till he comes. This is a continuation of a daily walk that we show forth his death till he comes. Because as we live our lives, we do a communion through our prayer on a daily basis, recognizing if we humble ourselves before him, we recognize his sacrifice. We begin walk according to his precepts and, and we walk according to what he says that we are. Then we also are communing with him in that manner as well. So I'm not belittling the idea of having communion such as breaking, uh, breaking the bread and drinking the wine because that's beneficial for your remembrance in a, on a, a larger level. So, Again, it's not necessarily a once a month thing that a lot of churches do, which is beautiful that it is being done. But as often as you do it, so you can do it on your own in your own home. You can do it when you need to, to remind yourself what Jesus has already done for you. To remind yourself the sacrifice that was done on your behalf. To remind you of John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And the son, the son loved the world so much that he gave his life so that he may gain eternal life for us, that he may gain healing for us. This is the importance of that blood and body being destroyed on our behalf. So there's a portion in John where it speaks about washing of feet. This is part three of that statement. It says the custom of that day was to have the feet of the people enter a home to be washed due to dirt gained due to their travels. This was normally done by a servant. Jesus was to show a level of humbleness uh, that is required to walk in the kingdom before men and God. So we use, we're going to use John 13, 7 through 17. We're going to talk about the washing of feet and what was meant by that. We're going to go verse 13. So again, you can read the other portion at your leisure. Ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So, he speaks to, to the point of understanding our ranking, understand where we are. He says, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Okay. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Jesus is not greater than the Father. Remember these things that we all report to the Father. 
We all look to him because it's his love that got the wheel rolling. It's his love that showed us the direction of our life. It's his love that sent his son to be a sacrifice on our behalf. It's his love that makes us who we are and who we are to be. We're still growing in grace and in knowledge, so it's not over. We got to go some more. We got to go some more. So in um, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 21, still in King James Version, I'm going to go to verse 15, and we're going to read from there. I speak as a wise, I, I speak as two wise men. Judge, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is, is not the communion of the body of Christ. Again, the word communion is used here to remind us, the thought, the, the, the spirituality behind, to remind us of our connection, our tying into, our becoming part of what's going on. For we are many, for we being many of one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Okay? Let's go down to verse 21. Well, I'm going to read 19 through 21 so we get a full scope of what's being said here. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not... Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifice, partakers of the altar. What say I then, that the idols is, not, is a thing, or that which is offered us in sacrifice to idols is it a thing, anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the devils, the table of the devils. So we can't appease the world. I have heard over time leaders speak in such a way to try to unite people um, under one guy saying that there's only one God, and there is only one God. But they try to attribute him to all the other sects that do not agree with the only one and wise God. The, um, the thing is, is that when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, we have to look at the what he's saying. What is the way? The way is the things he's shown us, the direction he's given us, the purpose by which he has called us to be who we are. This example is not by a mere prophet as others would say he's just a prophet. He was and is or the firstborn of the Father, the Son of the living God, the sacrifice that we needed to deliver us from the penalty of sin, the body that was broken for us. There's no other religion in the world that has such a great sacrifice from the Most High God through the Son to bring deliverance. So we got to be careful how we say we agree with others about God being God in the various religions. There's only one God. There's only one Savior. We must come through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must accept the sacrifice for the converting of our souls to be the sons and daughters of the Most High. I'm convinced of that. That all the other things may have a semblance of righteousness, a semblance of good in it, but it's not good because it's not God. It's not through the way he had planned and devised a way to move forward in him. We cannot be men pleasers. We must obey and serve the Most High God because it's right. We must spend time with him to recognize the rightness of his motives and his motion. That's why we must do my three steps. Fasting, so that we deny ourselves and our body becomes subject unto things that we can then find ourselves submitting before him. The flesh then moved out the way. Prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It availeth much because effectual means <clears throat> it's done with emotion. It's done with 
sincerity from your spirit. It's done from the depths of your heart, of your soul, so that you find yourself uttering out things from the depths of who you are to go before God. It's effectual. It's fervent. It's on fire of God, of the Holy Spirit. So we who have the baptism of the Holy Spirit has that fire in us because being baptized in the Holy Spirit and then being in filled with the Holy Spirit seem to be two different steps, but yet they're the same because when God has infilled us, we have the residing spirit of God in us that stirs up the gift that he's placed in us in our spirit from birth to then utter out the things that he wants in the land to cause it to come to pass. We have to be aware of that. Now, in order to know this, we have to study. That's the third step. We got to study the word. Study show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So these three steps are very important. Fasting, prayer, and study. So then we find ourselves doing his will in that manner. Okay? So in 2 Corinthians 13, 9 through 14, we're going to read a few verses here. Um, let's just try from the top here. Verse 9. For we are glad when the when we are weak, and you're strong. And in this, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, being absent, at least being present, I should use sharpness according to the power of which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Let's stop there for a second. I call upon my prophets, saith the Lord, the prophets of the land. Do not let the sharpness of your tongue destroy the possibilities of the healing of the nation. Jesus said, with kindness have I drawn them. For he was the prophet of our prophets in his walking as Messiah. And he spoke in parables and he's, you know, dealt with the kindness. He dealt with reasoning because scriptures also say in Isaiah, come let us reason together. Though you see may be a scholar, I'll make them white as snow. We got to realize that it's not an attitude that we take, that we fight against our own people to put them to shame. Our purpose is to deliver and set free. So we need to be quick to hear, but slow to speak, so that we say the words correctly. Remember in Ephesians it says, Study so that thyself approved unto God, a work that need not, not be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. That's a key and it's essential that we divide the word correctly so that we find ourselves doing his perfect will. So that we find ourselves not scattering the flock, but drawing them unto the Most High. They will humble ourselves before the Most High so that we find ourselves humble before man so they can see His good works through us. All right. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be patient. Be perfect. Be of good comfort and of one mind. Live in peace and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. This is not a salutation of departure, but inclusion of, of living perfect before the Most High. You say, I'm not perfect. I can't be perfect as God. No, you can't. You're right. The perfection they, they call for here is your perfection. You can be a perfect you, okay? Because a perfect you understands that you got to grow. The perfect you understands you got to continue to spend time in the presence of God. The perfect you had to be reminded of the sacrifice that was made for you. So you then can be walking in your most holy faith, okay? Because as you grow in grace and in knowledge, it's a progression. So at the point you are, you're perfect for that moment. But more perfection is yet coming as you grow in grace and in knowledge. This is all done because of the sacrifice. 
This is all done because the remembrance of what he's done for us and how he placed in us in good position before him. See, the sacrifice itself encumbers all his teachings. Also remember that he's also the end of the law. He said, not one jot of tittle of the law shall be done away with, but all fulfilled in him. So let's go on a little further. We're going to read some more concerning this sacrifice. Now, 1 Corinthians 11, 18 through 34, we used to read that starting in verse 24 concerning the Lord's Supper. And again, you can read it at your leisure. We're going to read some of it today and be mindful of things that we need to do to come before his presence in the right way. It says, verse 24, And we had given thanks, he break bread, he break it, and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Broken body, remember. He sacrificed his body for your healing. He sacrificed his body for the healing of the nations and taking of the sins of of the world away, taking away the iniquities that were found in the sin. After the same manner, he also took the cup. We had sup saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do, is, do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This New Testament was written in his blood. New covenant in his blood. The blood of God in which it was written in. Because it encompasses all of his teaching and it encompasses all of his direction. It encompasses all the fulfillment of the law that's found in him. Like I said, not one jot of till of the law shall pass away until all fulfilled. All fulfilled was fulfilled in him, which means he was a living example of the law. Now, many people struggle with the law because they looked at the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Remember, the letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. So he operated by his spirit to understand or to bring understanding about the law that he lived. And this is what we pick up on as we follow his example of fulfilling that law, fulfilling that purpose of understanding the laws of Moses were good. As long as that letter was attached to the spirit of God to bring deliverance and set the captives free. So as we understand the things concerning Yeshua, we understand the laws concerning Yeshua and how we walk in those things that he has brought for us. 27. No, 26. Um, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So let's stop there for a moment. <clears throat> Let me go on the next two verses. Let me go a little further on that. Uh, for if we judge ourselves, this is verse 31, we should not be judged. But if we are judged, then we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay. That brings the thought together for me. When you come before the Lord to remember him in the Lord's Supper, or what we call communion, remembering, having that thought, having that continual thought about what happened. And you come with all these things in your mind, contrary to the purpose of coming, contrary to the life that he wants you to lead. You will, according to the word, be eating and drinking damnation unto yourself. You're unworthy. Because you came for the wrong reason. You came with wrong things in your mind, wrong things in your heart. 
But understand this. If you examine yourself, if you judge yourself honestly, not giving yourself excuses, not giving yourself reasons to go ahead knowing that you're wrong in your own inner person, examine yourself thoroughly. Examine yourself thoroughly so that you give these sins, these thoughts, these transgressions up to the Lord. Cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. He'll take them away and they're no longer part of you. He cast those things and seal forgiveness to be remembered no more. So then when you come before the Lord to partake of the communion, partake of the Lord's supper, then you come worthy because you have put those things aside that are contrary to his will. Then you can truly remember, put a remembrance, the thoughts concerning his death, the way in which he died, the cat of nine tails across his back, the beating across his face and body, the spear in his side, the thorn of crowns, the nails in his hand and feet. Those things you remember because this was done for your deliverance, for deliverance of your sins and transgressions so that you then can receive the blood of the New Testament that gives you life eternal, that gives you total deliverance from everything in the earth. You then walk as God walks on the earth because you're now in the world, but not of the world. You're now accepting the things he says are beneficial for you. So with that being said, let's go a little bit further and we will um, talk more about the resurrection. John 13, 1 through 38 speaks about um, uh, more the um, uh, sacrifice that was done. This was going to the idea of about feet washing. And I read that earlier to you in respect to the rationality as to why. But we're going to look at it in the amplified version so it gives us a little bit more depth john 13 7 through 20 i'm gonna read only um 12 through um uh 17 then i'm gonna read um 19 through um 20 19 and 20. so let's go on further let's go on with this in the Amplified Version. So when he had washed their feet and put his outer robe and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and you're right in doing so for that is who I am. So if I, your Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet as well. For I gave you this as an example, so you should do, in turn, as I did to you. I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who has sinned greater than him who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed, happy, favored by God. You put them into practice and faithfully do them. Verse 19, from now on, I'm telling you what will happen before it occurs so that when it does take place, you will believe that I am he whom I say I am, the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah. I assure you, most of the Psalmists say to you, the one who receives and welcomes whomever I send receives me. And the one who receives me receives him who sent me in the same way. So, with all that being said, we want to talk about the sacrifice that was ratified in his coming forth from the grave. In John, St. John 1 through 31, it speaks about how Mary Magdalene went to the sepulcher 
to see the grave. But she realized that the Swami Rondo rolled away and the body wasn't there. So they ran to Peter and to John and told them what they saw. And they came running back. And Peter went inside the sepulcher after John had beat him to the sepulcher and saw that the grave clothes was laid down fresh on the place where he laid. And the head wrap or the napkin around his head was also in a separate place laid out flat. And he was not there. He was not in grave clothes anymore. He wasn't there. But yet in the same vein, they still were troubled because they didn't know where he had gone, where he was taken, per se. But in verse 10, verse 11, excuse me, of that chapter, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and, she, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And she seeth two angels in white sitting, and one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They said unto her, Woman, why thou weepest thou? Why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had said thus, she turned back, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed him to be a gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is say master or master teacher. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I have not ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day of the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. So this is the teaching concerning the first New Testament evangelist, Mary Magdalene. She heard the word directly from Jesus. She ran straight and gave the message of Jesus to the disciples, telling them that he is risen, that he is alive, that he is who he said he was. Hallelujah. That's beautiful. The first New Testament message came from Mary Magdalene. We know a story about Mary Magdalene. She was taken from whoredoms, but delivered unto God as righteous. And from her, she spoke unto the disciples and they believed. Thomas wasn't there at the time, called Didymus. And it was revealed to him later on. And as you heard the reading that he was he showed up in the midst of them. But the key is that he said to her, tell them, I'm going to your father, my father, your God, and my God. Identifying with us on this earth. Identifying of his sacrifice what he's placed in them. Because later on, he meets them again and shares with them more understanding. Still on earth 40 days. Still teaching the disciples. After he had gone to heaven to come back. Teaching them. He breathed upon them the spirit of God. So they will be able to stand in the day that was yet to come. And also the Feast of Pentecost being prepared for the infilling. Or the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that time. So... As we know the story about Didymus, he basically said in a nutshell, I wasn't there unless I can touch his, his oh, the hole in his side where the spear went through, the, the nail prints in his hand, I'm not going to believe. But Jesus showed him and said, here, touch me. Here's here the, here the prints in my hand. Here's the prints in my feet. Here's the uh, mark on my side. I'm here. 
and he believed. He said one thing that was so beautiful. He said, blessed are you because you believe because you saw, but more blessed are they that we have not seen and believe. So God bless you. You're blessed because you haven't seen it, but you have felt the presence. You have uh, acknowledged the presence of the Most High. You acknowledge the fullness of who God really is in this land and in you. And you believe. And because you believe, you remember. You bring to remembrance the thought of what took place to get you where you are. You remember the thought, what it took to get you to believe in fullness of the fullness of who God really is through the sacrifice on the cross. You remember as you break the bread and drink the wine that you take upon the suffering of his body and the life that's found in the New Testament by his blood. You remember those things. You remember also that he is the end of the law. He fulfilled the law. And thus we fulfill the law in him by obeying his understanding and precepts of the law, understanding that the letter killeth but the spirit maketh alive, and by his spirit, yet we are saved and we're delivered. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So I'm going to end at that point, not to end forever, but to bring a conclusion to this teaching. When we have communion with the Most High God, we are in remembrance of his sacrifice. The rationales of his sacrifice is to deliver us from sin and the penalty of sin. And then to write us into a new covenant, a new testament, in the presence of God by his blood. And as I echo earlier, every child has his father's blood. It means that Mary was impregnated by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, not by the heat of man, but by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. He has his father's blood. So when he was crucified, his blood poured out from his side with water into the earth, into you and into me. It poured into us to give us life everlasting. And all we got to do is believe. All we got to do is accept the sacrifice he has placed before us. All we got to do is acknowledge that he is who he said he is. As often as you do this, you show forth the Lord's suffering until he comes. God bless you. Peace be with you. And heaven smile upon you. Amen.